to drink my spotted pink red. It been the first time in my life that I stood there before in that charming fine place called ancient sweet Dunmore. At Dunmore Cross, after mass, what pleasure is there? Prevailed with the jingling of the Nice. We have Jabba the Rock and Dunmore. This book was launched to stay there, sir. It's packed with North Village knowledge, and we surprised how people spread out into the city. John Kang is on there. And so, I'm not going to be good at speaking, so I'll hand you over to John so he can do the rest of the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's talk. Um, I'm on TV here, I think, so I'm not sure where. Uh, you can hear me, can you? Yeah. Okay. Um, the talk this evening is entitled The History of Life in Anishrobal Parish, Ancient Sweet and Amore. Now, for those of you that are not aware of where Dunamore is situated, it's approximately 25 kilometres west, northwest of the city, approximately 8 miles from Garvey. Uh, there are two Roman Catholic churches there, two primary schools, two grocery shops, one daily gold outlet, and more importantly, four pubs. <laughs> and the population is roughly two and a half, three thousand people. The presentation which I'm presenting tonight is based on a book that published last October, um, actually it is 12 months tomorrow night, um, Ancient Sweet and More Life in an Irish Rural Parish to 1900. Now, I have selected what I hope to be some interesting stories and snippets, and in doing so, uh, it will also highlight sources for genealogy research, which may be of interest to a lot of people here. It is, not, it is in no particular order, so I ask you if you have any questions or thoughts, I will try to answer them maybe at the end of the presentation. First of all, my sincere thanks to Eddie and the Cork Genealogical Society for having me here tonight and giving me the opportunity of relating a story about a rural district that one must remember could tell the story of any Irish landscape or parish. The subject matter is based around the moor as a template, but many of you will identify with many of the intriguing and interesting details. And could I also say that your work, you the members, most of you are I presume, your work in the Society is very important. Uh, it's invaluable for researchers like myself and is a focal point for local and international study. And I'd like to wish continued success to your work and promotion. The Franco Prussian War, is that better? The Franco Prussian War of 1870 71 aroused much interest in Cork, and the Cork Examiner contributed greatly to this by its generous coverage and analysis of the war. It became the main story each day. First-hand reports of the siege of Paris stated, Our halls are full of sick and wounded. We use horse flesh, but never with a full appetite, and also as and mule flesh. We had one of these days a quarter of dog. Cox High Sheriff proclaimed that the terrible sufferings of the French are present in our minds night as well as day. The Lord Mayor called a meeting to initiate steps in providing aid. Fundraising became prevalent throughout the county, not least in Dunamore, when, where a sum of £21, 3 shillings, approximately 3,000 euros in today's value, was raised with contributions from all sectors of the parish from over 300 individuals. And as you see there, uh, this was a document that appeared in the Cock Examiner uh, with the list of contributors. Um, it was really a remarkable show of solidarity and generosity that must also beg the question, why such assistance to the French people? Uh, Professor Neville of UCC is of the opinion that an intense identification with Catholic French 
in their struggle with the Protestant community of invaders from the East was apparent. Another explanation could be argued that the response from Cork was a form of payback for everything France had given Ireland over the centuries, such as religion, education, refuge, food and sympathy. The Bishop of, of Orleans said that Cork had exhibited towards us a generosity which we cannot sufficiently bless. Now, Timothy O'Malley from Shandangan was an agent for an absentee landlord, Christopher Henry Ebury, of Ashford County Wicklow, who held a large estate in Dunamore. He had a horrid relationship with the tenantry, and the distressed tenants wrote to Ebury complaining of Manny's attitude and his unscrupulous demands by bribes. Now, it all came to a head in December 1788, and many will, will, will know that that, that was an era when white by activity was prominent all over Cork. Manny was holding court in two weeks' public house in Dunamore, receiving rent payments. A number of armed men with guns, swords, and other weapons interrupted proceedings and immediately focused in on the agent or Manny and dragged him out of the establishment. He was beaten profusely, with five of his teeth knocked out. Then, in a show of humiliation, he was put on a white horse with a saddle of furs and white tartan bushes. Not very comfortable. This was seen as traditionally as a symbol of corpus. Manny attempted to escape as his assailants debated on their next move. This action was a mistake on his part as he was subjected to what was described as grief of a shocking nature. A bit graphic. Uh, paragraph follows. A stick was inserted into his mouth and his tongue pulled out and cut. His eye was stabbed, joints of his fingers were cut and bones extracted from the sockets. His arm was broken and several cuts inflicted to his face and head. Left in the river, the attackers were confident that he would die a slow death. But the 70-year-old miraculously survived and was able to give details of his attack to the authorities. Subsequently, 18 men were committed to the county jail. The incident created widespread condemnation, not alone locally, but was featured in the editorial pages of the Derby Mercury in Derbyshire in England, describing the incident as they are existing in this kingdom, wretches who equal in savage ferocity the Aborigines of America. Mr. Ebree, the landlord, wrote to the Chief Secretary, Albert Fitzalbert, informing him of the severe barbarity upon Manny's agent. In turn, Fitzalbert informed John Healy Hutchinson, the Secretary of State, who in turn proclaimed that no exertion in the power of government shall be wanting to bring people to justice. Subsequently, Manny applied to the assizes of the Grand Jury for representment to be levied on the parish of Dunamore in compensation. And here is a document, the, sorry, the document from Trinity College, uh, dated 1789 from Timothy Manny, addressed to the Church of Warden in Dunmore and addressed to the Constable of the Battery of East Mosby, relating what happened to him and his intention, as I said, to levy uh, a presentment on the parish of Dunmore. Um, official notice. So that, that document is really a very old document, 1789, uh, included in the Ebury papers in Trinity College. In any event, two brothers, Edmund and Dennis Murphy, and one James Scanlon, were convicted and sentenced to be hanged. And in a show of defiance, and probably sending out a strong message uh, to all, the three men were executed in three locations, one in Larry, one in Dunmore and one in Ballinamora. So people thought again maybe maybe do something like that. Okay, so we go on to the slide. This is John Drew, an image, a Fenian, and the, the image is taken from the Fenian photographic file in the National Archives. He was described as a weaver of a different character, believed to be the active and dangerous centre of Dunmore. Now, Sinter, in this context, 
was a term used for the head of a group of ten or more Fenians. Drew was detained in Cork Jail, moved to Mount Jai Jail in Dublin, and was later discharged on condition he paid bail and left the country. And the authorities accompanied him to a ship in Dublin Bay, and he was transported to Liverpool in England. Drew's colleague and fellow Fenian, David O'Callaghan, a native of Dunmore, lived in Easton's Hill in Cork City. He was assassinated in November 1869 in Pinrose Quay in Cork. His cold-blooded murder was clouded in deep mystery. The well-known newspaper at the time, The Nation, stated his funeral as soon as the appearance of a public demonstration. Placards were placed at the gates of all the city chapels, signalling the death of David O'Callaghan, may he rest in peace. The men of Cork are requested to attend the funeral from the Southern family, and God save Ireland, read the notice. He was obviously a respected and prominent member of the Fenians. Up to 400 young men assembled at the hospital wearing bands of crap or crape. This was a black band around their arm, and marched behind the house. It then made a grand procession through the city, and on its route to Dunamore, many people lined up at various junctions and joined the solemn procession. It subsequently came to light that Callaghan successfully smuggled goods regularly from London, where he was well known. And it transpired later that there had been quarrels between sections of the Fenian command and Callaghan was most likely the victim. Now, most of you are familiar with this image, uh, the bottle factory in Shandon, which was an iconic landmark in 19th century Cork. In the famine year of 1847, many families from Dunamore fled to here in the hope of refuge. A report at this time told of two unfortunate creatures from Dunamore huddled under the old Garrett house in Shannon Street and therefore, thereafter removed to the Cork workhouse. Given such influx of people from all areas of the county, the Lord Mayor of the time, with the head constable, had to resort to walking through the principal streets of the city and cleared them of the numerous destitute families nightly occupying the hall doors and lanes. The Cox City Relief Committee in May 1847 reported that a large proportion of the fever patients were from the district of Dunamore. In October, the Cox Constitution reported that for a period of nine days, a number of pauper families from the neighbourhood of Dunamore had located themselves under the sheds adjoining Shannon Guard House. The Lord Mayor then suggested that a shed be constructed for their protection in the Blackpool Predator Market. In one particular ward, St. Patrick's in the city, 314 additional paupers were identified. Of that sum, 90 were from Dunamore. The situation became so bad that the poor Lord Guardians published a notice warning all strangers to quit the city and refer them back to their own parish's generosity. Now, agrarian outbreaks of violence in Cork in the early 19th century caused the authorities to devise an elaborate scheme whereby tenant farmers were offered assistance in immigrating. The British government appointed Peter Robertson to lead an exhibition to Ontario in Canada. Nine ships left Cork in 1825, with over 2,000 selected tenants on board, all promised up to 70 acres of land and a new beginning. One such family were the Regents from Derry, Dunamore, and their story is indicative of the trials and tribulations in making a new life. Timothy, the husband, was sick when he embarked on the laborious journey, and Catherine, his wife, was eight months pregnant. Reluctant to leave her sixth husband, she was ordered to another cabin with her four children aged six to sixteen. Having given birth to her fifth child, she was sent to the immigrant hospital on landing in Quebec. Her husband, still sick and isolated, was also sent to the hospital on the same day. Unfortunately, he died not having seen his newborn child. Further tragedy followed as Catherine, exhausted from childbirth and greatly mourned by her husband's death, suddenly died. The Regan children were now orphaned, and the ship's captain put them into care with an accommodating woman with eight dollars, the amount left to them by their hard-pressed parents. To compound the misery, it was discovered that their chest of bodily possessions were misplaced. 
a future of promise that trumped misfortune. Would they have been wiser to stay at home in Derry? Such are the crucial decisions made in life. This is a unique picture uh, of a person called John W. Hoonan, John William Hoonan, who was a farmer that resided in Derry, Dunmore, and a popular member of the National League at the time. His life was changed dramatically in March 1890 when he was charged, among others, of assaulting Timothy and Catherine Reardon. In the subsequent trial, he was sentenced to seven years' penal servitude. Now, his penal record file, which I retrieved after almost three years' search in the National Archives, provides a fascinating story of the trial with detailed witness statements, his detention in Montreal jail, and the deposition's de de efforts to obtain clemency. Some notable people testified as to his, his character, including Bishop McCarthy of Klein, C.J. Harold, Justice of the Peace, Robert Day, High Sheriff of Cork, involved with the Cork Historical Society, John Redmond MP, later to be involved with the National Volunteers, Charles Tanner MP for Mid Cork, and Morris Healy, well known MP for Cork City. Mr. Tanner, at one stage, submitted a parliamentary question to the House of Commons regarding the well being of Hornham, and whether, in view of the mitigating circumstances attending his conviction, and now they released would be recommended. So that's there was pit, there was images of Hornhen when he went into prison. But I picked this image of when he came out of prison. So um, it's it's a unique a unique, unique image of a story. Now these are two standing stones of the moor in the townland of Meaconee. Now folklore tells us that. They were possibly used for marking boundaries of land in pre-Christian times. The stones were seen as supernatural figures. Various claims asserted that they were connected with the sun and sun worship, were used as grave markers, and in more modern times, if one goes into the country, during the, especially during the grazing season and the hot summer, which we don't have too often, um, you can see cattle using them as scratching stones, and that they, they go up to the stone and they, they scratch their Whatever. Um, that's what it, if, if you're in the country any day, you'll, you'll see that, especially in a hot, hot day. Now, this is an advertisement for Dunamore Athletic Sports, uh, August 16th, uh, 1896. Um, the scene on the day must have been spectacular as the Cock Walking Men's Band travelled on the Mosby tram to the sports. The tram was still in its infancy, it was only opened in 1893. When the passengers disembarked to a vibrant move to Prairie, they marched up to Mary Hill, followed by the many patrons who had travelled on the same train. When they reached a bus claimed Dunamar Cross, where the sports were being held, they received right of way to into the sports field and created a unique atmosphere only known to many of our ancestors. A record 21 sprinters lined up for the 100 yards, necessitating eight heats. It was reported that from the city, great numbers journeyed by rail, car and bike. The name Luta Prairie is interesting, and its origin could be related to a protest during the landmark to Prairie town against the landlord Smith Barry, where the tenants withheld rent, resulting in them being evicted. They proceeded to build a breakaway town called Luta Prairie. Around the same time, 50 miles to the south, in the parish of Dunamore, Construction of a new railway, railway line from the infamous St. Anne's Hydro Station in Blarney to Dunamore was underway. The last stop in Dunamore was at the town of Coolmore. One theory is that, with the episode in Tipperary Town getting notoriety, some wise cracks in Coolmore decided it would be opportunist or appropriate to rename the location of the last stop as New Tipperary. Another theory is that some work was involved in the building of the new town into Prairie, ended up in Cork, more specifically in Dunamore, and helped to finish the railway line to the parish. In recognition of their contribution and perhaps with a little persuasion, the De Prairie workers suggested that the location be called New De Prairie. 
I suppose it was perhaps a fitting compensation for their earlier efforts in their own country. Uh, this story was uh, featured in uh, an Irishman's diary uh, back in June in the uh, Irish Times. Now, this was the Dunamore number 5 locomotive, seen here stationed at the Cock Western Road, formerly Julie's Hotel, now as you know the River Lee Hotel. It weighed 25 tonnes, had a water capacity of 5,000 gallons, a coal capacity of a, one tonne. And the abbreviation there, CNMLR, stands for the Cochrane Mosby Light Railway. No, a caution to the public and a caution to the, the attendance here, I suppose, to take it on board. Um, an unusual advertisement, which I came across by chance, in reception of something else. Uh, the blanks are obvious for a reason. <coughs> caution to the public. I hereby warn and caution the public not to give my wife, she was named, any credit to my account, on my account, as I will not be accountable for her acts in future. Signed, her loving husband in the Noir, December 21st, 1870. Um, this is a narrative of the family in the uh, Briefly, it appeared in the Southern Reporter, 1847. Um, from information derived from a gentleman from the parish of the Noir, it appears that the people of that locality, in common with those of the surrounding country, are suffering in an extraordinary degree from the privations they are forced to endure. An account he gives of one family named Brian residing in the Bogra Mountains. The Bogra Mountains would be uh, on the upper part of the, the mountains of Dunmore. Uh, describes as, uh, as much human suffering and misery as can well be conceived. At the present moment, two of the children, aged respectively 15 years and 10 years, are lying dead in their wretched cabin from starvation and have remained. Uh, on Eden, I think, for the last 10 days. While the father, mother and another child are unable to crawl out to seek a subsistence in consequence of their weekly and sickly condition. And the only means they have of support is the charitable contribution of the benevolent passengers on the Kentuck car collected for them by the human humane driver. Unfortunately, a sign of the, the times of the famine. This is an interesting uh, address, was really. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, information wanted of Timothy O'Reilly, who left Ireland from Down in County Cork about five years ago and went to England, age about 24. He was bald. He had four brothers in the United States, one of them dumb. Any information to Thomas O'Reilly in Kilmarton, Dunmore, County Cork. English papers, please copy. Uh, a unique connection with Daniel O'Connor can be seen from this report from the Limerick Reporter in November 1847. Uh, detail there is a marriage at the height of the family between James Edward O'Connor, nephew of the late Daniel O'Connor, uh, to Anna, daughter of Jeremiah Lynch, was held interestingly in Lynch's house, Kilcullen House. Uh, he was a middleman who held over 1,700 acres in the parish. Interestingly and, and uh, pointedly, Daniel O'Connell had just died just a few months uh, previous to this marriage. That's Daniel O'Connell the Livia's room. Now, um, from the point of view of reception, um, this is a document from the Ebury's estate papers, which I talked about earlier on in Trinity College, detailing correspondence, wills, rentals, deeds, etc. from the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century. The Ebury connection with Dunamore originated in the mid 18th century when one Mr. Ebury bought the lands of Golan. Christopher Henry Ebury died in 1811 and his estate passed to his sisters, one of whom, Marcella, married Reverend Henry William Crofton in 1826. And from the point of view of reception, um, you will appreciate that uh, you need a lot of patience and time to dissect on that because that probably um, is much worse in reality. Um, so 
there's a lot of detail in it, but uh, it takes a lot of uh, patience and time to make it out. So that's what you're up against in these document papers. Um, the archaeology research for my book was based on many noted antiquarian and archaeologists' notes on their visitations to the moor, a parish which, according to the journal of the Invalian Society in 1913, was the richest storehouse of prehistoric monuments in Munster. One such antiquarian, John Wendell, deposited his original notebooks uh, to the Library of the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin. And one such document is seen here, dated May 1836. Wendell lived in Blair's Inn, and there are 11 volumes of his work based on Cork antiquities in that collection. Fascinating collection, in the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, the discovery of what was telling them on the Talbot Home Stones was big news in the archaeology world at that time. Uh, the Royal Irish Academy found them so unique that they purchased them from the landowner. Now this is the rooms of the, a late 9th, 17th, 8th century, 18th century church with graveyard at Lockerbourne and Dromoma. This is the location where the patron saint, St. Lachdean, founded an early Christian church in the 6th century. Lachdean's brother, Trian, one of the early saints associated with the church, attended St. Finbar School in Cork. And Cork being a powerful monastic centre, was always looking to expand its territory. Dunlick McCossick, the abbot of Cork, led the monastic community in 1828 AD to claim the territory of Mosgri Mitin, present-day Mosgri, an area that included Dunamore. If he did, he met strong opposition, and in a subsequent battle, 200 of his followers were left dead. James N. Healy, the well-known actor and writer, claimed his grandfather's belief was that the Normans destroyed the church in 836 AD, and that it was rebuilt by his namesake's family, who were always regarded as earmarks or custodians of the church property in Dunmore. That church still exists today in Dunmore, uh, deteriorating unfortunately, but uh, still a good representation of what it was, what it was like. Uh, this is an 1875 Dunmore directory, which um, is around the time after the Fenian Rising, just before the Land War. Uh, we can see the lists of clergy, Reverend Lane, Reverend O'Connor, <coughs> the rector, Reverend Quarry. Reverend Quarry was a great man for the uh, antiquities of the parish and, and spent his Sundays walking around looking for such like. Um, you have the landowners, you have uh, the vintners and miller, you have various people uh, owning a lot of land there, uh, such as Ruby Townsend's um, and the Ruby family, and Jonas Stable. Now, this is a very interesting map of ecclesiastical sites and ring forts. The black round circles represent uh, the ring fort, uh, or the ring forts in the parish. The smaller circles represent ring forts less than 25 meters. Uh, the, the bigger ones obviously represent the bigger ones. But you can see there, um, if I can use this, yeah. Uh, okay, we have Kilcullen South here, all the way up here, up towards the mountains, above the mountains. You have a profusion of forts. There are 18 articles. Um, one particular fort just here, that's the river Shona coming down here, at the river Gypsy, as you say. Uh, one particular fort hangs on a cliff, it's in a deformation. Fantastic uh, uh, view of the valley from the cliff. Uh, there are approximately 18 forts up here, up around here. And as you can see, the red here represents the ecclesiastical sites, Kilcullen South. So there was a community here associated with the ecclesiastical site here. Um, Further on here, you see in the parish of Minkwani, Kulmona, and I had these forts here, would have been associated with the ecclesiastical site in Dunmore Cross, which we just saw, the ancient church. Um, and if we look further down here to Bunkilla, 
There's some forts there, not as much. That was an equally skilled site, and that was an old church there as well. Uh, and if we look closely on the borders here, a profusion again of forts uh, on the borders of Grenada. Uh, there must have been very uh, formidable opponents because the, they seem to have been protected fairly well just there. Um, then you had a clean down here, clinic. Uh, that was another ecclesiastical site there. So to just give you a flavour of what is in the parish, um, uh, these are just the forts in the parish. And you can see the, the, the profusion of, of, of those around there. Now this is um, the book of survey and distribution. Um, when I was doing the medieval chapter in the book and the assessing of sources, uh, it presented a very big challenge because you were dealing with a lot of Latin references and Old English. Um, the book of survey and distribution, as many of you will know, were summarized records of the transfer of land forfeited during the Catholic Rising of 1641. The place names are interesting as they are the denominations which existed between 1636 and 1660. Uh, there are no tenants recorded, which is a pity because it, it would have been of much interest. Now, starting from the left here, uh, we have the names of proprietors in 1640-41. Um, the location of the lands in Dunmore, uh, the number of acres, one column here, profitable and unprofitable. This was determined by the Down Survey. Uh, the names of the post-1660 proprietors after the Cromwellian Wars and the new owners after the Willamite Wars. Uh, Stephen Ludlow, most probably an adventurer who had provided financial backing to the war uh, or was a soldier and was rewarded with, with, with these lands. And the various symbols here, uh, W and etc. Other symbols here. Uh, they indicated whether the, where the land was disposed disposed of, whether it was by court, patent, or otherwise. Now, the well-known family in the Healy's owned 6,000 acres of land in 1641, and all of this was confiscated after the rebellion. It was not until 1660 that the Earl of Clancarty, formerly, formerly Lord Mosby, and from the McCarthy dynasty regained his lands when Charles II was on the throne. But the Healy's still did not win back their lands. A remark by one of the Healy's in talking about the McCarthy Lords came back to haunt the family. While Macca's Lord might be forgiven, as a follower he would not be. Subsequently, some Healy's did lease land from McCarthy's, but in many cases they immigrated and became part of the wider wild geese serving in the French and Spanish armies. Cromwellian battle sites documented in earlier maps would name such as Putman Narragig, the Bog of Slaughter, Barna and the Trasna, the Gap of Strife, and Cunuk and Orr, the Hill of Slaughter. These are all symbolic of the brutal outcome. You can see here now the various um, spellings and placing into locations. Um, the Healy, interesting, that's the way to spell now, Healy. Uh, various uh, variations of the Healy name, or Healy, Valley Carrick, Munton Land, these were the various spellings at the time. Coolmore, Coolmonies, Fornox, Valley Cunningham. Now Dunamore itself had various names as well. And just for people, Dennis for Dennis and Fulu for Foley. Um, that's the William Wars. Now, this is uh, Kulmona House in Dunmore. Uh, at one time, a McCarthy clan dynasty where they lived. Now, I don't know what the Volkswagen vehicle is doing there, but it's, it's there in there. Uh, that was one of the most popular cars at that time, whatever year that was. 
Uh, now, not far from here was the location of the Ford family home. And an interesting story emerges here. Michael Ford immigrated to New York in 1893. And in the evenings, he frequented the lobby of a building in Greenwich Village in Lower Manhattan, where fellow immigrants and locals met and chatted. Now, he befriended, uh, befriended one particular gentleman by the name of Samuel Clemens, who was seen most evenings writing uh, in his desk. Now, that man, of course, later was more well known as the author Mark Twain. And descendants of the Ford uh, family in America still have in their possession the writing desk used by Twain. Now, this is a close up of the Glebe House in Coolmore, Dunmore, built by Reverend Horatia Townsend in 1752. He was rector of the parish for 40 years. One of his descendants, Charlotte Payne Townsend, wrote a book entitled. Mrs. G.B.S. The title influenced by her marriage to George Bernard Shaw. Given the close family ties and the culture of visiting the big houses, for hunting, horse riding, attending balls, it is not beyond the bounds of possibility that Shaw accompanies his wife here to Dunmore, to this house. Uh, the house was later purchased by the Catholic Diocese of Klein at the top of the century. Reverend Michael Toole was the last clerical occupant. And he swore he could, that uh, at night time there were strange noises. He could hear the horses coming up from the road up the, the old avenue. Uh, he said, I, I, I remember talking to him, and he, he said he did get very used to it, and he did that take much notice of it. But definitely there was something eerie about the place. And for a house going back to 1752, with all its history, uh, it, it wouldn't be very unusual. Now, this is an image I have in the book. Uh, I'm just reproducing it here to create and help to appreciate the magnitude of these stones. Uh, it is noteworthy to record that folklore tells us that a farmer died here when a, when a falling stone crushed him as he was looking for treasure. Father John Murphy, local curate, documented that a print of a human foot cut into one of the stones and that there was also a cup mark detected. These are massive stones that they don't, you don't get the, the sense of monthly up close to really. Now, this is the capstone of what was an unclassified megalithic tomb in Kulikin. Kool in the Koch archaeological inventory for Mikoch. This in its entirety was a burial chamber of cremated remains built of large stones and covered by a mold of stones with an interest at one end. The capstone was the top of the, the formation uh, and was probably supported by upright stones. Now, what is interesting here, this particular farmer recreated this for some his own reasons. Um, whether the archaeology people are aware of it or not, I'm not sure. But uh, what is interesting here is that you see the old capstone of an earlier age, and then he decided to build a kind of a shrine, and if you could see there, the Blessed Virgin Mary is inside it. So it's an interesting contrast between the old and the new. Now, this is Fornert House. Um, it was a parish, the parish priest's house in 1840, Reverend Morgan O'Brien. Now, he did church work in the parish, building Fornert Church, one of the ch two churches in the parish, and at the time, building four schools. Um, his correspondence was Reverend John Hamilton, who was secretary to the Archbishop of Dublin, Dr. Murray, reveals very clearly the anxiety and mental anguish he was enduring, and this is re revealed graphically in the book. Very interesting um, first hand account in the Dublin Diocese records. This is the 1826 Thai Plotments. Many of you are familiar with Thai Plotments. Uh, this was the process by which the value of land was calculated. The charge to each landowner was relative to the amount of quantity or quality of land held. Uh, you will notice, if you can see it, uh, the various uh, landlords 
uh, named, uh, and a lot of the land was bishop's land, which would belong to the, the bishop of Klein. The land laws rented it paid from the bishop at that stage. So you will see some land laws there, such as uh, Thomas J. French, uh, Horace Townsend, Henry Longfield, Samuel P. Townsend, Patrick Hassett, John B. Gibbs, G. H. Bennett, George William Brazer Craig of the Dunwell Craigs. This is again a unique inside view of a ring fort, one of the biggest in Dunamore. Um, you will see the Acton Bank out here, which is the entrance, and then you have what they call the Fosse. Uh, the app from that was built to was used to build this interior ditch. This is about 12 foot high. So you have the entrance in here, a big ditch here, maybe uh, 10 foot high, into the, the hollow here, and then up here, and you're into the ring fort. And in here is a suit lane. Um, so it was specifically, as many of you would know, these ring forts were built for security protection. So by the time any attack came in here, uh, he had to go here then to attack his, the, the people inside, so it was, it was a, not a, a, an easy job to do. This is a unique photograph where I, what can I say, I uh, immersed myself into a hole at one stage. Uh, this is the suit right inside there. Uh, a unique photograph of the um, inside of the, the suit rain. Where you see the masonry up there and the growth of uh, lichen and, and whatever there. So it's a unique photograph of, of the construction of the suit ring. These are the Kilcullen pillar stones. It's the Ecclesiastical site which we talked about earlier on, one of the Ecclesiastical sites. Uh, this is where an ancient burial ground or keel existed. Uh, Windale, the uh, antiquarian again, formed the opinion that the site was the entrance into the, into the keel. Another archaeologist, Richard Brash, concorded with Windale that it appeared that a pillar stone originally stood at each corner. Two were standing, but he's of the opinion that it was four there as a grand entrance. Um, one of the stones had a normal inscription. I think it's this one that still has a normal inscription there. Uh, tradition held that a great chieftain was, a chieftain was buried here as a result of him being faithfully killed when his horse sported and kicked him. Um, this is part of a larger site of, of an, an ecclesiastical enclosure, as, as I told, as I said. Um, uh, and Dr. Gillian Bozeman, an independent scholar, contends that it marked the grave the grave of uh, a founding saint, possibly Saint Cullian, and a prominent clergyman associated with a church or abbey. So these stones are still intact here. If anyone wants to see them, they're uh, documented in the archaeology, archaeology uh, inventory of Midcock. This is a unique document again, going back to 1850, uh, an often report from the Dunham Refuge. Uh, which I sourced from the British Library. The refuge host, housed 24 orphans and was confined to children of Catholic parents. It was established by the rector, Reverend John Rogerson Cutter, a man of high intelligence, said to have a brilliant mind but very controversial. He was alarmed and saddened by victims of the famine and raised money from generous friends in England to help these famine victims and also improving their mortality and spiritual needs. Included in this refuge was a schoolhouse, sleeping rooms, a kitchen and wall garden. The children did all the necessary work associated with the running of the refuge. Documented evidence toward of Reverend Cotter's proselytizing activities here. Now, this activity is captured vividly in a poem I came across in the National Library by a person with a pen name of Varian, telling of a proud mother, tormented by her devotion to the faith and the survival of her children. It is a very powerful poem, 
if one listens to it carefully, and I'd like you to just bear with me while I uh, recite it. If you if, 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 if dwell on the words, it's a very powerful poem. This is the woman talking. Again the knee is bent, the outstretched hands are widely clasped, the startling eyeball glares, and with a fearful strength the mother's cry ascends to heaven. Oh, give us food or else we perish. Give us from the store which God had lent to thee or we must die. But the tyrant's voice falls like a weight upon her tortured ear. Thou shalt have food, but first thou must renounce thy hearing fate and yield these children up to the pure guidance of our holy church. Thou must forsake the dark and fearful creed to which my, thy fathers clung. Now answer me. And he was answered by the flashing eye, the quivering lip and burning cheek and brow. The drooping head was proudly raised and scorned, and stubborn defiance gave those lips a voice. Keep thou thy preferred help. We will not crave pittance at thy door. We will not stain our souls with poisoned food. For what is this, that we should fear him, this, our only friend? She turned away, and crawling from the spot, lay down to die. This is a view of an actual famine road in Dunamur. Uh, it was planted by trees, uh, or planted with trees by the farmer, but along this way is the actual famine road, which is very distinct and can still be seen today. Uh, these famine roads, as many of you will know, were started and in this nowhere for no particular reason, except to give work to the deprived people for what pittance they got. Um, now, this is the more police barracks. A number of slides I have here now uh, tells of the work that was carried out there in 1855 uh, by a uh, specific tradesman. Uh, John Coffey here, uh, I worked 48 days at the Dunmore barrack at one penny a day, or one shilling a day, not sure, one shilling a day, November 1855. Uh, 22 horses drawing sand and tree shillings per day. 1855 again, Daniel McCarthy. Six horses uh, drawing line at three and six per day. Cornelius McCarthy. Uh, Patrick Connell, 16 horses drawing seven at three shillings. Uh, 14 horses drawing line at three and six. 11 horses to Cork at three and six. Six pounds, 15 shillings, and six pence. November 55. This is a an itemized uh, uh, bill by Dennis Colley, who was a well-known uh, blacksmith out there. Uh, as you can see, three window guards, 15 shillings, uh, 16 bowls, 2 shillings, 8 pence, uh, 2 wall breads, uh, 10 chisel pines, shilling and 3 pence, uh, a kitchen crate, a shilling, and 6 a shilling, I think. Uh, pinting a crowbar, a shilling and three cents, a three pence. Six box of staples. Uh, unique record of a man's work uh, for, in this case, the barracks. Um, this gentleman, Matthias Gallagher, again 1855, he slated the Dunmore barrack and found it to be uh, 17 square out of 5 whatever per square. Uh, but he was very uh, humane and he charged, uh, he made an allowance for the chimneys, 5, five shillings. These again are, are very unique documents that uh, I found in my research. Now of interest to people in the city, not Main Street especially, this was uh, uh, a trader, Dennis Connors who did oil, dye stuff, paint, pitch, tar, resin, machine grease, sheet lead, glass of harvest, uh, Portland cement, uh, window glass, malt hops, etc. 15 North Main Street. 
as you can see there, uh, Charles Daly was the agent for the landlord which we talked about, Ebury, and he got some provisions for the school. And to tell you of the double victim and uh, sad state of the school, I suppose, he had to get 22 panes of glass and 7 pounds of putty. Um, now, this is uh, James O'Sullivan, a teacher in the Avery Crofton School. Uh, just acknowledging uh, a receipt, uh, having received from Reverend Crofton uh, the sum of one pound thirteen shillings and four pence sterling, being the month's salary due to me as teacher of the Dunamore School, recognised and supported by the said Reverend Crofton. Uh, Easy forty-seven. So that really was right in the middle of the famine. Now the same John Sullivan was an enterprising guy. He, he, um, he sent a letter to uh, the antiquarian Windle in 1847 as well. I wish you could uh, get me some sort of a job to transcribe, he said. There are bad times and anything would be better than being idle before and after school hours. I venture to say I will give satisfaction to any gentleman that will honour me with his communications. I can write well uh, and I will write fair and legible. And he continues, As you have such a host of friends who, whose delight is in the Irish language, perchance one of them might give me a few crumbs to pick by writing at intervals from them. Uh, he talks about his wife and his two little ones. And bemoans the fact that he survived on the 20 uh, pounds sterling a month. Uh, the Lord has provided, he said, and the Lord will again. Now, this, for those of you that are interested, maybe, or doing some research, this is another uh, genealogical, uh, genealogical source, uh, the Register of Trees, which is a series of Register of Trees in the National Archives. Uh, this was a documented registration system where a landlord or a tenant could plant trees in his holding. The tenant could claim the value of the trees on his lease expiring. In order for a tenant or landlord to prove he had planted the trees, he was obliged to register them. Now, in this slide, this is a faint slide, but it, is, it, it tells of John Rovey of Colour in the war. Um, He's, he registers in 1844, and the trees that he registered uh, were as follows. He planted 700 oak, 600 ash, 200 beech, 700 larch, 400 scotch fir, and 200 spruce. So these are records of national archives which uh, cover the whole of Cox County relative to most areas, so they give a good idea of the people and the uh, picture of, of, of the time. Now this area uh, is unusual in Dunmore. It's called the Kiln, uh, the townland of Nakhorok. Uh, the Kiln, with its 7th century connotation, had an ecclesiastical reference to a church and monastery. Uh, the cock inventory says this is a possible burial ground and records a further burial ground adjoining a house to the east here. Now, down this road here, just down here at the corner, is St. Lachty's Well. Uh, that's another story because uh, uh, in years gone by there was a desecration act committed here and it was said that the well had moved to Grenada. So it's no more down there really, but the location is still prominent there. Um, there also is this, this area here, uh, the possibility that it was a kiln where unbaptized children were buried as according to church law they could not be buried in consecrated ground. Um, it was not unusual that these type of grassy islands were used and called children's crossroads. So obviously an archaeological survey here would reveal a lot of stories, I presume, and, and a lot of detail. Now, we talked earlier about the Mother Tucker's uh, stones 
there was four stones uh, found in the water one stage. And this was the first stone. Uh, this was an image from the National Museum where I sneaked uh, an image when I wasn't supposed to sneak an image. But anyway, um, this was uh, a pillar stone where it was, you could see the hole there on top. And you see the distinct ohm writing here. It's, it's a um, private place in the treasury room of um, the National Museum. Um, the, if we move on to the next one, this is St. Lachine's Reliquary, which is featured in the front of the book. Um, now, the, this was, um, this is also in the treasury room of the National uh, Museum. Um, and I suppose the Lamar is very fortunate in that they have two uh, very prominent features uh, in that uh, front room of the treasury uh, room. Um, no. Okay, what am I? Yeah. This is in the shape of a hand, uh, as you can see, and crafted in bronze. Um, it's regarded uh, by scholars and esteemed antiquarians as one of the most important and finest examples of 12th century Irish metalwork. Um, a cavity near the fingers uh, held the relics of the patron saint, Saint Finba, or Saint Lachtine. Um, and Charles Smith, in his book of, of Cork, The History of Cork, stated that it was used as a holy relic in which the community swore on the most solemn occasions. Over the years, it has deteriorated in, 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 in size, or not in size, but in, in features, I suppose. But it, it was once a very um, uh, authentic and, and beautiful piece of, of, of craftsmanship, and still is today. That can be seen in the National Museum as well. This is a letter from the Commissioners of National Education to the Chief Secretary of Dublin, we, a petty session clerk. The petty sessions were the local courts at the time. John Carroll was principal of Belly Kelby National School and was a part time clerk at the Hadeland petty sessions. His dual role was formed upon by the Commissioners of National Education. It came to a head in 1880 when it was learned that he was absent for two days from his school. Canon Pope, as manager of the school, said the principal was being interviewed for the clerk position in the petty sessions court. Uh, his role at the Petty Sessions Court just involved one day in the month. Correspondence followed between the Register of Petty Sessions in Dublin Castle and the Education Commissioners regarding Mr. Carroll. Canon Poe received a letter from the educational body threatening that if Carroll was not relieved of his duty and a new principal appointed, school grants were to be withdrawn and the school was to be placed on the suspended list. Uh, the manager had a change of heart. Uh, as you can see from this letter, and uh, he says here, I regret more ever to be obliged to add that uh, Mr. Carroll not only refuses to resign office uh, as clerk of the petty sessions, but he uh, defiantly uh, refuses to conduct, uh, refuses to, to uh, with, uh, I think this is, um, Abolish, uh, I'm quite sure it was very hard to read. In other words, he, he wasn't one to resign um, without the intervention of the, the manager. Um, in either way, um, he took the large lieutenant in Dublin Castle um, to sort the situation out, and in, in, in time, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Carroll had to resign his vision. So this went all the way to Dublin Castle, as you can see here. So it was tough being a teacher at that time. I can tell you. Uh, again, uh, the tall end of our you could see the different um, uh, scenarios of uh, song names and people and connections. Uh, this was the Looney who was uh, near Toomey. And these are Toomey's down here. This Thomas Toomey was a bow ranger. But one thing about Barakar in this particular place is that it was mainly made up of Toomeys and Loonies. Uh, and 
you had different nicknames for the different uh, families of tumors and nunis. So I know from personal experience it was a minefield because uh, there was a stage in my life where I had to uh, take over the, the postal duties of my father as a 16 year old and I traveled this country and I can tell you with the loonies and tumors it was a minefield. Now this is a, an image from the front of, my, of the book, a beautiful image of the countryside no more from, from the uh, lower parts of uh, the Bowery Mountains called Up the Hill. Uh, this, is, this is not a, uh, what can I call, uh, uh, where, where, the, where the, the stock pictures, this is an actual stone that's there. And you can see the valley, uh, this is where the valley, uh, when I talk about the ecological sites going up all the way to Baragoy. So, uh, a beautiful part of the country. This is um, uh, a very faint um, document, but it, it tells the story of uh, the Society of um, Friends, the Quakers uh, uh, in Cork, the Committee in Cork. Uh, they uh, were very prominent uh, in the family, and not many people might know it, but they gave assistance and, and grants to a lot of uh, uh, people. Uh, uh, and here you have, um, if I can see it somewhere, uh, it is a very faint document, but uh, included here is uh, some grants to the Reverend Cotter, which we talked about. Uh, he got a grant of a barrel of Indian meal and two barrels of biscuits for his orphan school. And in the same sequence of grants, uh, the Catholic parish priest, Reverend Michael Lane, uh, obtained four barrels of biscuits for the Catholic schools of the parish. Um, I suppose this shows the contradictory nature of the two religious institutions, each striving for funding in pursuit of defending the interests of their own church. And here, you might be able to see now, but there are also grants allocated to areas such as Clannacilty, Yall, Barahastig and Macroom. Again, this document is not readily available. Um, through much searching, I, I came across uh, a lot of these documents. Now, the New York, uh, the, the, Horror, the York Herald was a North Yorkshire newspaper, first published in 1790. In its edition of January the 5th, 1899, it recorded that in January 1898, Daniel Callaghan from Dunmore, County Cork, was said to have reached the extraordinary age of 128. And if, as reported, he was a vigorous young man during the seven times of 1798, the article concluded that the statement may be perfectly true. How true that is another story. Uh, again, this is a faint picture of uh, the rental account of the landlord Reverend Crofton in Dunmore in 1850. Detailing the town land, the tenant's name, um, the arrears due uh, in November 1850, uh, the uh, amount of one year's rent in the second column, and uh, the total rent and arrears in November 1851. Uh, and here on the side, there was some remarks that were made as well. This is the same one here for uh, the estate as well, so it gives a unique perspective of uh, the time. Uh, this is just a document um, signed by Dominic Buck. Now, Dominic Buck um, uh, sent a formal letter to the Ebury estate stating that he was appointed seneschal of Paris Steward of the Manor of Dunamore by the Lord Bishop of Clyde. And he reminded the owner of the estate that his tenants were obliged to attend the manor court of Court Baron, which dealt with land transactions, and Court Lee, dealing with policing and serious offences. A fine would be imposed on any tenant who did not attend. Manors were fixed territories, and the church of Dunham Cross, which we saw earlier, was the manor centre. This is a despairing letter around 1788 of one Catherine Connell, again from the Ebury Papers in Trinity College, where she tells her landlord, Mr. Ebury, of the distress she has endured from his agent, Timothy Manny, the man 
That was decimated, as we remember. And she says, He has long been seeking my own, and I fear he has completed it. The language she uses is very striking and emotive. In an impassioned plea, she added, Whatever is to be the fate of me and my infant children, may all happiness attend you and your family is the constant prayer of your distressed tenant. Your Honour, I beseech you to have pity on my children, whose living lungs shall daily pray, pray for your protection. This plea to play on the emotion of the landlord and the contrast and usage of our children's plight was possibly in hope to strike a chord and alleviate our position. This was Catherine Calvin. This is just an indenture or deed made between the Lord Bishop of Clion, Samuel, and Henry Crofton. Um, that's dated in 1845. Uh, it specifically includes orchards, uh, bogs, mills, mill seats, mill streams, commons, moors, marshes, woods, quarries, fisheries. Uh, and interesting, down here, the rent payments were to be at quarterly intervals. Uh, notably, on the first day of May, the first day of August, the first day of November, and the first day of February. Um, that's that one. No, this is a distressing picture again. We talked about the orphan school in Dunmore, uh, which originated from a situation where two orphan girls died when returning from the, the McCroom workhouse. Uh, they went there to gain admittance, but were not uh, admitted. And they died in the abandoned cart left at Dunmore Cross, in which they had been transported to McCroom. Now, the Reverend Cotter had earlier that week visited the orphans at their home and found out from his workmen later on that they were dead. Uh, alarmed, he planned a refuge for famine orphans, which we talked about. Um, and the suspicion was that it was a pastoralizing uh, crusade. But it gives a very Im uh, vivid picture of the situation. That's the actual church in Dunamore with the entrance, you know, the house and cat and the two unfractured orphans. Um, now this is a letter taken from the British Parliamentary Papers uh, by the Reverend Crosser again. Uh, this is December 1846, telling of the dreadful situation in Dunmore. Um, just to go through it very briefly, saying, saying about the people, they have waited for days and weeks in groups with their spades and shovels but wait in vain. Uh, had we not uh, fed them with uh, small portions of such food as we could collect, many deaths by salvation would have occurred, as in other cases. Uh, the poor creatures have eaten their living hens and have stripped themselves of their necessary day and night clothes to buy food. But this and all other sources are fast drying up. Their sad cry to us is, we cannot hold out much longer. And a, and a passion plea uh, that was made by Cotter Weiss directly to the British Prime Minister, Lord Russell. This is a view of the Glebe House, which we talked about earlier from the back, that not uh, readily uh, seen. This is the back of the house. Uh, this is the entrance to the wall garden. Now, an unusual but striking feature of the Glebe House looking at it from the lawn, the entrance door. Uh, again, this is a um, documented subscription list um, from 1846 sent to the Relief Commission Office of Dublin. Uh, contributions from the landlords of the area. But you will note a significant contribution here Yeah, Patrick Murphy, labourer, one shilling. How he, how he came to have that money or had the, the humane uh, desire to give it is another story. And you also see here that the Dunmore police uh, gave 10 shillings. You have well-known landlords there and the, the priest, Reverend Cotter, gave a contribution of five pounds. Uh, Horace Townsend, five pounds. Samuel P. Townsend, ten pounds. 
this is just uh, an idea of what uh, you might come across in research. This is the National Archives again, um, where um, it details the famine distress papers. Uh, and for anyone researching, it might be advisable to, to note the format of the records. Uh, it's a complicated index system, as you can see here, D1410. C represents the person concerned, which in this case was Reverend Cotter. Uh, more is indexed there in various uh, references. Um, and depending on the filing system, uh, out of those four references, you might, they might be only able to find one because they've been misfiled or whatever lost down through the years. Um, this is a half yearly rent received um, uh, through Timothy McCarthy uh, of six sh uh, shillings and 11 pence um, for the fairs and markets of um, Golan. This was a fair, there was a fair in Golan. Um, the first fair in Golan was held in 1617 in the McCarthy Lord Dynasty era. Era. So this is just a receipt for the fairs and markets. Um, six shillings and eleven pence. Now this is a receipt to um, Charles Daly again um, of uh, the pool or race that he was built for. Um, the Macrum, the Dunamore, the Dunamore was part of the Macrum Union. So this is land valuation is 44 uh, pounds. His rate was pound 78 shillings. We're nearly finished. You'd be glad to know. So if you could just bear with me for a few more. Um, this is a letter from an immigrant, <coughs> excuse me, a letter from an immigrant, Margaret Nagel Torpe, in Lacobarn in 1867. And she talks about her life in a new world the Fenian Rising, her little brother Johnny, and her efforts to educate himself. This was a letter which I received from um, Cambridge Miller in, in the USA, uh, who kindly gave me some details. All these are in the book anyway, uh, if you wanted to pursue it. This is transcribed, obviously. Now, this is the last <coughs> slide. Um, a very interesting story here um, and reinforces again the alarming degree of forbearance that characterizes the ability for many people to survive. Uh, Timothy Real here, this is a photo taken in New York years ago, he was about 90 years of age. Um, he attended, believe it or not, a head school in Fort Ottawa War in the 1820s. And he wrote a fascinating first hand account of his life. He was born in 1817 in Dunmore. He trained as a carpenter and immigrated to Bradford in England in 1844, just before the famine. He married a lady by the name of Alice Knowles, but they did not have the best of fortune in their early married life, losing two infant babies. They immigrated to New York in 1848 and later moved to Chicago by sailing vessel. The railway was not yet constructed at that time. By this stage they had three children, but tragedy befell them as their infant son died on the ship. With the cooperation of the captain, Timothy the father obtained some boards to make a coffin. In a remarkable situation that must have been emotionally difficult, Timothy and his wife buried their son on the Michigan shore on a scheduled stop for timber. And in what must have been a poignant scene, all the passengers disembarked and went to shore for the funeral. Settling in St. Charles, which is about 40 miles west of Chicago, Timothy endeavoured to build a house. With no mill nearby, he had to prepare everything by hand. And after his day's work, Timothy devoted his time to construct the house and he said, uh, remarks in his notes, from the 4th to the 16th of July, I never undressed to go to bed. He did not edit, all my plans for the future were upset. 
His wife died in childbirth, and though the newborn baby survived, it only lived for a month. Following this traumatic event, Timothy was, as he said himself, introduced to a widow and was married within a week. He was blessed with three sons, but his tale of woe continued. One of his sons was sick for a year, but died at the age of 14. Another son cut his knee with Timothy's chisel and was forced to put his leg in ice for two weeks. Nearly recovered, the young boy did the unthinkable and dropping the same chisel, cut his leg once more. To compound this, the energetic boy smashed the fingers in his hand so bad it was feared he would have to have his hand amputated. Thankfully he didn't. One wonders, I suppose, how any man could absorb such blows. It seems so right.